Program Manager at the Westport Center for Senior Activities in Westport, Connecticut. Welcome everyone. This is the second part of a series called um, A History of uh, Food in Recipes. And what we decided to do is pick a recipe that um, has been around forever. And when I mean ever, I mean hundreds of years. So we don't, we, when we're cooking food, we, we think, oh, this is a, we think, oh, this is a recipe that, my, you know, my grandmother made, but we don't think that her grandmother made it and her grand, and that one's grandmother and that it's, you know, generation after generation. So, um, so this is, um, we just did um, Welsh rarebit last, um, but my last lecture, this one is on Hannes quadratus bread or manchette bread. And it is about Roman times. And then next, my next one will be on baklava, which is a sweet pastry that dates back to the 1500s from the Ottoman Empire. And Gabriella actually has spent part of this week um, researching that topic for us. So, um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we're gonna watch a PowerPoint. So that one. Okay, and... Okay, can everybody see the screen? Yes. Okay. So the history of manchette bread, manchette bread is really a term that's more general European um, bread that dates back to, um, to the medieval times, basically. And then this particular bread is, is just another name for it, Pompeii's Panis Quadratus. And we're going to talk about the, kind of the history of bread, but also we're going to learn about um, the lifestyle of the Romans back in the 70 AD up to 79 AD when uh, Mount Vesuvius erupted. So what is Panis Quadratus bread? It's a high quality wheat yeast bread, usually in a small circular loaf. It's got a fine crumb, which means that it doesn't have a lot of bubbles in it. So it'd be more like cakey than it is um, like a focaccia, which would have a lot of bubbles and it'd be airy. It's a very dense bread. The dough is relatively stiff and when it was created, bakers would knead it with their feet. Uh, by Roman times, however, animals were used to drive a belt that drove the mixer and ground the grain. So um, we'll, we'll see pictures of that. When making a single loaf, it's mixed on a board. Um, it's tied with a string. So you can see in this picture, it's tied with a string prior to baking so it can be transported. And in Roman times, it was always cut. Um, it was always sliced on top into eight, eight portions. Bread was a staple of the ancient Romans diet. Um, it was based on, on the Mediterranean triad, which is what they had, people cooked with what they had available to them. And that's called the Mediterranean triad. Cereals, which would be bread, anything from grains, olives, which they made olive oil from, and wine, <laughs> which um, was made from grapes and would be also uh, made into vinegar. It's believed that there were 30 bakeries in Pompeii alone, and each of them must have had produced an enormous quantity of bread. If you think, um, in 1862, when archaeologists discovered uh, Pompeii had been um, this lost city due to the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, uh, they discovered one bakery had 81 loaves in it, ready to be sold on that fatal day in 79 AD. So um, they put the they put they had 81 loaves baking in this bakery. So um, you know there it was pretty much. I'm impressed that there was an industrial kind of society going on, I had no idea in, in um, 79 AD. Olives were essential for daily life, um, mainly as olive oil. Olive oil was used for fueling lamps. Um, they actually used olive oil to wash themselves after exercising. Uh, Roman cuisine would never have existed if they didn't have cereals, olives, and as I said, the grapes. Grapes were eaten as they were, but they could also be made into wine. Um, <laughs> grapes are also, even today, if you wanna make your own sourdough starter, um, to make bread, grapes are used to make sourdough starter. Um, so they they're, they actually, if you let them ferment, you end up with a yeast that is a living yeast that can be made um, into starter. In 5000 BC, vinegar was used to preserve food. So way back in 5000 BC, they were pickling food. So pickling's been around that long. Um, in 400 BC, uh, Hippocrates used vinegar for medicinal purposes including coughs and treating um, colds and cleaning wounds. So um, vinegar was, you know, it does kill bacteria. So they must, they probably didn't know that, but they knew that 
um, it would um, clean wounds and make them heal faster. So grain was the dietary staple for, uh, of everyone from the richest to the poorest. In wealthy households, wheat would be finely ground and baked into a doughy white bread. So, so they actually were able to refine um, wheat and make a white flour like we have today. You know, we're talking about 70, the 70 AD, which is um, pretty amazing, but that would be very expensive because it takes a lot more um, effort to do that. So more labor would cost more and you also get less of a yield. So when you um, take the wheat and make it into a fine white flour, uh, you do lose volume. So, um, so the richest people would have had uh, you know, a finer white dough bread. The very poorest of Rome were entitled to a free grain dole which they would either take to a baker. So they actually got free grain and they could then take those sacks of grain and take it to a baker and that baker would make bread for them or they would make porridge with it themselves in a pot of water and eat that. So the, this was kind of interesting. The grain dole was created by Rome to avoid the famine. 60 pounds of grain enough to feed a man and his wife were given to, um, to them once a month. So they, got, they actually got 60 pounds of grain. And um, grain, grain, the grain came from North Africa, it was imported from Egypt um, under Claudius in 58 AD. So, um, so they weren't subsistence farmers. You know, they, they were importing grain as we import grain today or export grain. They, um, and again, they had um, to take care of the poor. They did have food subsistence programs and it was called the grain dole. If porridge was the easiest Roman food to make, bread was the most common, especially in the later, year, later years of the empire, when the free grain dole for the poor was replaced by free bread. So eventually they, they went from, here's your 60 pounds of grain in a sack, and you can choose to take it to the baker and have him make bread, or you can eat it as porridge. They then decided that was kind of cumbersome, so they decided that the, uh, they would just give the poor free bread. So... Um, that happened towards the end of, um, of the 70 AD. They also, uh, which is probably why we had, they found these big bakeries because now instead of people, uh, now these bakeries were baking for, for the population. So bread was produced on an industrial scale in large bakeries and the standard form was the panis quadratus, a circular loaf scored along the top to form eight slices. Um, the bread was mixed at a bakery or they called it a Pristinium. The, filling, the milling of the grain, mixing and kneading were done by machines. The only time hands were used to shape, uh, used was to shape the loaves. So what you're looking at here in this picture, um, they would hook up big straps, belts to the um, top part. If I do this, I maybe to this part. And that would turn and grind the grain. That they would have mules or they could have slaves actually turning them. In this picture, it doesn't look like they're too close to have a, a horse going through or a mule, but they would either use mules to turn them uh, with belts or they would use um, slaves to do that. And that ground the grain so that they could make the bread. Um, Archaeology um, explorations in the Roman city of Pompeii have turned up carbonized examples of um, Panis Quadratus, as well as many wall frescoes fe featuring its bakery. So you can see in this picture, they actually, they pulled that out. That was an, from an archaeology dig. That was a loaf of bread that somebody, some baker put in his oven in 79 AD. And then wow. um, he died before it got taken out of the oven. So, um, so that's how we know what it looks like. And we also know, you can see a similar um, picture here. These are frescoes on the walls of the, um, of the bakeries in Pompeii when they were, did, did the um, archeology span dig. <clears throat> um, judging by the archeology span record, Panis Quadratus was a fairly common food, at least in urban environments where many people would have been buying their food rather than growing it and cooking it themselves. So what we're seeing is, Pretty amazing that in 70, the 70 AD time frame, they uh, it wasn't too much different than us. I mean, they didn't, every family didn't make their own bread. They didn't grind their own grain. They had uh, a really kind of an industrial society. So 
So the cheapest dark, uh, breads would have been very dark. The most expensive would have been, as I said, a lighter uh, made from a finer flour. Uh, because this was interesting because flour was ground in a stone mill or quern, bits of stone would have entered the mix and worn down people's teeth over time. So when they found the bodies, they knew, noticed that their teeth were really worn and they, they thought that that's, um, the stone would break off from the, um, the grinding wheels and uh, that would wear their teeth down. People had to be on the lookout. This was interesting too. People had to be on the lookout for low quality bread made from bad flour. Um, did you all know that there's bad flour? So no. flour, especially whole grain flour, which still has some of the germ in it, which has the oil in it, can go rancid. So, um, so people had to be a lookout for low quality bread made from bad flour. And um, in an effort to tackle this, bakers were required to stamp their bread with their own personal identifier so they could be tracked down by authorities if they, had, if they tried to cheat a customer. So they actually, um, I think I have somewhere, I have a picture of it. Um, is there, I hope there's a picture in there or not. Let me see. Um, okay. So, um, Panis quadratus, quadrates, I guess. This is made from a standard buckwheat and whole grain flour. Um, it's made with the same, the, and then there's a fine one, the more expensive one that the richer people would have eaten would have been made with white flour. So buckwheat is actually not a wheat. It's actually, it's not a grass. Um, it's actually, um, their seeds are triangular shaped like the beech tree, and that's why they call it. It was first cultivated in 6000 BC. And it contains phytochemicals, rich source of protein, fiber, B vitamins, and minerals, niacin, magnesium, manganese, phosphorus, 72% carbohydrates. So, so buckwheat actually is not a wheat, it's a grain. However, just like wheat. Um, so the eruption of Mount Vesuvius was considered one of the biggest natural disasters of the ancient world in 79 AD. The cities of Pompeii, Herculeum, Stave, Opalantis, and Boscoreal were completely buried. The ruins were discovered in the late 16th century. The remains of more than 1,500 people were recovered with numerous objects. And the most uh, amazing remains were found in Pompeii. And maybe some of you have been there. I don't know if anybody's been I've there. I've been to Pompeii. You've I've been, been to Pompeii? Yeah, been to Pompeii? I've been to Pompeii and Herculeum. Yeah. Ah, yeah. must have been <laughs> fascinating. Fascinating. Yes. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. So do you remember seeing these bakeries and things? No, not at all. Oh, yes, I did. I you did. Do. They were, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was recently. Mm -hmm. So everything, yeah. everything was open. It was like takeout. They have takeout there. Oh, yeah. Um, I saw it. They, they I had saw it in 1964 is when I saw it. <laughs> they didn't no. have the bakery open. No. No, no. No, they had, I mean, they, they, I mean, it wasn't obviously it wasn't takeout, but they had these these uh, kiosks that mm. um, that showed exactly how people came with their they came with pots and then they yeah. were being filled. And uh, this wow. is the way they purchased their food. It was like a, a, a yeah. little, little tavern in the open air. Yeah, it seems so modern to me in a way, and it's and yet it's seventy nine A.D. Correct. Yeah. Amazing. Unbelievable. Holly, can I, Holly, what about a flower that was infested with, uh, with bugs? bugs. Is, is it that? Yes. Well, that again, that's why they had to put their stamp on it. Somewhere in this thing, I have a picture of the stamp. And then when you see the video, you'll see how they, they mark their loaf when he makes the loaf. The town was buried under 13 to 20 feet of volcanic ash and pumice. Uh, they theorized it was a wealthy town. It had an aqueduct that provided water uh, to fountains. And then if you were rich, you might have water in your home. Um, the eruption lasted for two days. They had pumice rain for 18 hours. So many people took this as a sign to leave because they only they found 1,500 bodies, um, which considering the population at the time, which they think the population, what they, they projected was, was um, that they feel a lot of people did leave when the pumice rain started. People died of, of ash suffocation um, and breathing in the, the vapors of sulfur from the, um, from the eruption. They also think, this was interesting, that the eruption was in October or November. And the reason that they know that 
or theorize that is that the vegetables that they found that were um, uh, in the in the dig uh, were kind of petrified were fall vegetables. Uh -huh. They knew that those were fall vegetables, so they theorized that it had to have been around the harvest time that this um, uh -huh. eruption. So they found the loaves of breads inside the ovens. Oh, there's the little, see that? That's actually a stamp that would be um, for that particular baker so that he would have to stamp the bread so that they wouldn't be able to trace it if they sold bad bread. So that's how, that's how they kind of stamp the bread. Um, and that's actually baked into the loaf when it goes into the oven. By the texture and shape, it looked like it just came out of the oven. Each loaf was marked with a baker's stamp. Um, in 1930, another carbonized loaf of bread was found inside an oven located in Hercules. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip plenty of the elder because you can hear about that on the video. Um, different bakeries, um, bakeries ovens that were discovered. So there's some pictures of them. Um, there's the bread that they found. There's another picture of the, the grain. Uh, Right, the grinding, the grist mills. So, so if you were to make the bread today, um, you would use buckwheat, whole wheat, and or spelt flour. Um, you would use biga, which is um, freshly fed sourdough starter, uh, three teaspoons of salt, 500, 400 to 500 milliliters of lukewarm water. And that depends on how loose your starter is. It has to do with what the humidity is. Um, so that's, when you're making bread, the amount of water to flour ratio, it's close, but never exact because it kind of depends on the feel. Um, and then they would put certain herbs in it, fennel, um, hyssop, coriander, anise, oregano, and caraway might have been added to it as well. And then just a couple of pictures of the grain. So that's spelt and that's, um, let's look, spelt looks like growing and there's buckwheat. Um, spelt, I mean, so spelt is actually in the wheat, um, is, a part, is a wheat and buckwheat is not. Okay, so let me, um, so now let me show you, watch this guy who does the video on um, this particular bread. He's kind of thinks he's funny and he's sort of not so funny, but, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you'll get a laugh out of him, but he's very interesting and he kind of explains so now I gotta go back to share screen. Gotta go here. Well, here I guess I'm gonna do the British. I'll do the British Museum guy first. So this guy is um, a chef, and he was asked by the British Museum to try and recreate the bread because the British Museum in 2013 was doing an exhibit on um, Pompeii and um, art and um, artifacts. So. So they asked him to do this. So you'll see him making the bread. He's trying to recreate the, the loaf. Two-thousand-year-old bread. Two-thousand-year-old bread. So it didn't turn out to be as easy as we thought to reproduce this bread. But uh, here we are, we got some flour and we got some buckwheat flour, which was the flour that they use all the time, it was more ready available. So we're gonna go a kilo of that, so like two pounds, and uh, we prepare a fountain. And here we got a little bit of the as we call it in Italy, Mada or Biga or, you know, because obviously they didn't have yeast as such, but they would use like a sourdough as we call it now, okay? It's lovely smell of acidity. And it's coming up. There you go. And then here I got a little bit of water. It's got a bit of salt in it. And I'm going to Gently with my hands. Apparently they were using as well some kind of 
different animals to move around, different machines that mix the bread. But obviously being in wood, nothing was left over from it. Slowly I put it all in, then I go in the middle. And then with the hands, I'll bring it in. Okay, I'm gonna work it really gently, yeah, and try to allow it to turn always a little bit of air, so it gets trapped in there, so it makes it nice and lighter. As you can see, it's a very straightforward door, and very well stratified, and really, really nice. So I'm going to shape it down like that and I'm ready to go. And then we're going to press it out. Okay, so here I got the right shape, sides, and uh, the only thing I had to let you raise for a minute, I think one hour and a half to two hours would be more than enough in the temperate room. There we are, got one one hour and a half, two hours, and it gets much softer. And you know, this is where I start to have a problem because in a normal situation, I would bake this one and it would become a beautiful, I can make little cuts to make it a little bit more. But here on the picture that I got here, the bread is divided like if it was, it was like a, a token. Like it's, it's almost like somebody gets paid one piece of that. So, and there is this sort of like line around which I cannot justify myself. I, at the start, I thought it was baked upside down or something like that. Obviously, it's not, because otherwise they would have found the tin in the oven. So the only thing that I sort of thought about it, it could be then, in order to make it easy to carry, they would have baked it with a piece of string around it. And I'll show you what I thought. So I'll put the string. As I'm going, I'll fix it in. This also will guarantee the fact that each of the pieces of bread will be roughly the same size, because the string would be the same size. Okay, here we are. I'm going to pull it. And that's it. I'm happy with that. Okay, now, shaping is perfect. I'm going to make the cuts. Okay, I'm going to make, I'm going to divide it in eight. One, oops. One. And eight. Eight of these lovely little cap will allow the heat to come out, will allow the thing to raise. But then, as we can see in the picture, each of the slaves had his own little mark. So we make we made a little Locanda Locatelli sort of double L, which you're gonna place here. Like that. Like in our logo. And then a little weight on top of that. And now I will double this up like that. And when the bread is ready, I could actually carry through this tree. So I'm ready to bake it now. Okay, we're gonna take away our LL. And this is who make you for a fantastic loaf of bread from Pompeii. Okay. 
Very nice. All right. So... Where's the butter? <laughs> All right. Let's. We're gonna watch this video. It's twelve minutes, and this guy tells a little more. He's kind of funny or thinks he's funny, but it, it's gonna give you a little more background on this. Okay, Jason's going to send this, this right? Sound, some poor baker yes. heard that fateful autumn day in 79 AD when Mount Vesuvius blew its top and showered his bakery in hot ash and gas, carbonizing a loaf of bread in the process not to be seen for 1,800 years. Sucks for him. But great for us, because today we are going to take a look at that most iconic ancient Roman loaf of bread, the Panis Quadratus, true Roman bread for true Romans. This time, on Tasting History. So as we saw in the episode a few weeks ago on Apicius, we have a decent number of recipes from ancient Rome, but we don't have one for bread. What we do know of their bread comes from writings about bread, not really recipes, pictures done in frescoes, and then the burnt loaves from Pompeii and Herculaneum. Now, a lot of people have recreated this loaf of bread, and I will link to some of those uh, resources in the description, but I'm going to take my cue from London chef Giorgio Locatelli, who recreated this loaf some years back for the British Museum. And if it's good enough for the British Museum, then it's good enough for me. Though, I've actually made some changes, so maybe it's not. Anyway, like 90% of breads out there, chef Locatelli assumes that this is made of flour, water, yeast, and salt. And when I first made it, those are the only ingredients that I ended up using. And it made this lovely, beautiful uh, loaf, but it was rather bland. And so um, I ended up doing it again. Now that first loaf, I only used uh, whole wheat flour, gorgeous color. This second loaf that I'm doing today looks rather different, but I'm hoping that the flavor is better because I'm adding in some herbs. So for this loaf, you will need 1,000 grams of flour, 250 grams of biga, or freshly fed sourdough starter, three teaspoons of salt, 400 to 500 milliliters of lukewarm water, and then some dry herbs. I used about a half teaspoon of fennel and a teaspoon of hyssop. Also, the amounts of those ingredients are a little bit variable depending on how loose your starter is. Uh, my starter ended up being a little tighter than I usually like, so I ended up using that whole 500 milliliters of water, but you might not need it if you have a loose starter. So the first question you probably have is, what kind of flour do I use? Well, you got options, kid. And for answers, we are going to go to that most prolific of ancient Roman writers, Pliny the Elder. There is no grain that displays a greater avidity than wheat, and none that absorbs a greater quantity of nutriment. With all propriety, I may justly call winter wheat the very choicest of all the varieties of wheat. It is white, destitute of all flavor, and not oppressive to the stomach. Sounds like Pliny would have been a fan of Wonder Bread. Now, Pliny goes into <laughs> extensive detail about the different wheats of the empire. He talks about their weight, their color, their flavor, yada, yada, yada. But he saves the top three spots for the wheats of Boeotia in modern day Greece, the Isle of Sicily, and Egypt. Then Pliny talks about flowers made from other grains that the majority of the people would have eaten, like barley, rice, spelt, sesame, and the wonderfully named panicium, or African panic grass. Ha! Ah! So for this loaf, I ended up using half buckwheat, bad name because it's not a wheat, uh, and half whole wheat. Um, and I'll, I'll show you, it really changes the look of the loaf uh, when, once we're all done. Um, but you can use whatever flour you want. Pliny also has a lot to say about leaveners. Uh, he talks about one that's made from millet and must, or the skins of uh, fresh wine grapes. And that is where the yeast would come, from actually the yeast that's on the skins. And then he talks about one made from barm. In Gaul and Spain, where they make a drink by steeping corn, they employ the foam which thickens on the surface as a leaven. Hence it is that the bread in those countries is lighter than that made elsewhere. And just a note, by corn means grain, not like American corn. And then there's the kind that I'm going to use, which is just regular old sourdough, which pulls its yeast from the air. Good old California air yeast. Not sure why that's Southern, but whatever. So first take your water, lukewarm or room temperature is fine, and stir in your salt. Then mix your herbs into the flour. Then take your flour and dump it out onto a flat surface and create a ring or what's called a fontaine. Then in the words of Johnny Cash, Pour that yeast in that burning ring of flour. 
and start to work the flour into the sourdough starter with one hand while you pour the salt water slowly with the other. Then just keep mixing as the dough comes together. And like I said, you might not need all of that uh, water, so just kind of keep an eye on it. You want, once it comes together, stop adding water. If it's actually too wet, then just throw some uh, more flour in there and you're good to go. Then go ahead and knead your dough. I kneaded it by hand. It took about 15 minutes to get uh, kind of a nice smooth dough. But if you have a bread maker, you can go ahead and use that. I wouldn't use a stand mixer because this is a lot of heavy dough and you might burn out that motor. But if you do have a bread mixer, no shame in using it, especially because then you'll have a free hand to tap that subscribe button and the notification bell so you never miss another episode of Tasting History, which would be a disaster. Not Pompeii and Vesuvius, but a close second. Now, once your dough is kneaded to perfection, place it in a bowl, cover it, and let it rise for 90 minutes to two hours, or until it about doubles in size. So now, a lot of classical writers wrote about bread and, and wheat and all of these ingredients, so let's take a look at why relying on Pliny the Elder is so apropos for this bread. We're calling these the new billion dollar solar panels. They're a new generation of super powerful solar panels that was just released. Bread. Gaius Plinius Secundus, AKA Pliny the Elder, best known as an author and philosopher, but overachiever that he was, happened to also be the admiral of the Imperial fleet moored at Misenum, north of Naples, on that fateful day in 79 AD. Sadly, his nephew, Pliny the Younger, not incredibly uh, creative with names, this family, uh, he was the only person to give an eyewitness account of the disaster, a blow-by-blow -blow of the eruption. And he gives us some insight into just how his uncle died. Here's where the story picks up just after the eruption. My uncle's scholarly acumen saw at once that it was important enough for a closer inspection, and he ordered a boat to be made ready, telling me I could come with him if I wished. I replied that I preferred to go on with my studies. A chance to check out a massive, black, unnatural, looming cloud coming over the horizon, and this kid decides that he's gonna stay home and do homework. I mean, I know I'm not one to talk, but nerd alert. He tells how his uncle took several ships to go to Stabiae to check on a friend. And it's a little odd because clearly he was worried about his friend enough to, to go down there. But then when he got there, they packed up some stuff, put it on the ship, and then returned to his friend's villa for dinner while they watched broad sheets of fire and leaping flames from Mount Vesuvius. My uncle tried to allay the fears of his companions by repeatedly declaring that these were nothing but bonfires left by the peasants in their terror. You should have terror too, Pliny. You should have terror. But clearly he did not, because after dinner, he went and took a nap. Finally, some hours later, and only because the courtyard had gotten so filled up with pumice and ash that they were in danger of being trapped inside, did they decide to hoof it, with pillows strapped to their heads to ward off falling objects. So when they eventually get to the ships, Pliny realizes that due to the earthquakes caused by the volcano, the waves are way too high and they're trapped. So he sits down on the beach and takes a rest. Then the flames and smell of sulfur which gave warning of the approach of fire drove the others to take flight and roused him to stand up. He stood leaning on two slaves and then suddenly collapsed. When daylight returned on the 26th, two days later, his body was found intact and uninjured, still fully clothed and looking more like sleep than death. And that's how most people died that day. It wasn't lava, it was noxious gas and falling ash. And that's kind of lucky for us because instead of being completely flattened, Pompeii and Herculaneum are wonderfully preserved, including their bakeries. One such bakery, or pistrinum, is that of Popidius Priscus. He had his own mill with four giant millstones made of basalt lava. Foreshadow much? They were likely driven by donkeys to grind the grain into flour. Then in a separate room, the dough was mixed using huge mechanical paddles. So if you are using a, a bread machine to make this, that's okay, because they didn't do it by hand either. Popidius approves. In fact, it seems that the only part of the process that was done by hand was the actual shaping of the loaves. And so that's what we're going to do right now. This to me was huge. My neck and chest are amazing. Now, so set your oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit or 205 degrees Celsius and turn your dough out onto a lightly floured surface. Then knock out the air. Then shape it into a ball and set it on either a baking sheet or a bread cloche like the one that I used. 
And if you are using a bread cloche, be careful because they're delicate. I broke mine today. I'm very sad about it. Then pat the loaf down into sort of a flat topped cake and cover it and let it rise for another 20 minutes or so. Once your second rise is done, we're gonna go ahead and give this loaf its iconic shape. So take a piece of baking string and tie it right around the middle of the loaf and cinch it so it looks like my waist in pants that I haven't worn since before quarantine. Now for the lines on top, there's a lot of debate, uh, but there's debate on everything to do with this loaf pretty much. So using Occam's razor, I'm going to go with the simplest explanation and use the string that we've already got to make four deep impressions on the top which creates eight separate sections. Then stick your finger in the middle of the loaf to make an indentation to keep the bread from cracking and slide the bread into the oven for about 40 to 45 minutes. If you are using a cloche, remove the lid about 30 minutes into baking so it can darken up a little bit. Now my loaf did not need to darken because I used that dark buckwheat. So honestly, it kind of looks like the, the burnt loaf from Herculaneum, but it smells fantastic as it's baking. So once the loaf is done, remove it from the oven and set it on a cooling rack to cool. So here we are, our Panis Quadratus, or Roman loaf of bread. And you can see the vast difference between just using two different types of flour. So, you know, use what you want, but just know that some are going to look uh, more, more pleasing than others. If you're doing this for pictures, I'd go with the lighter flour, it's prettier, but, um, this other one, the, the darker one, smells a lot better than the other did. So let's cut into this. It is definitely dense. But you kind of knew that by the shape. So let's take a little bite here. I don't like the color. I gotta say, it smells good, but I don't like the color. All right. So it's definitely better than, than the previous loaf that I had tried, but still not great. Current Italians do it better, I think. But, uh, but then again, we don't actually know because all that we've got to go on are, are the looks of the bread and, and some of what Pliny tells us. But that's, that's how it goes, you know? Sometimes, sometimes you win and sometimes you don't. If you're interested in other ancient Roman recipes, I have a playlist down here of all the Roman recipes that I've done so far on the show, so I will see you next time on Tasting History. Oh, wait, pause. All right, pause. Yeah. Hey, everyone, welcome to Forward. We are... <laughs> okay. All right, um, so what did you all think? Any comments? Nobody Anybody put any think? butter on it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they dipped it in olive oil because they had they had a lot yeah, of olive that oil. Yeah, could be. That so could be. be. Yeah, and they may have put some herbs in the olive oil like we do. I didn't like the way that set, that one looked. It was too dark and so dense. Yeah, I think it, it would be more like um, if you've ever had a real German pumpernickel that's um, yeah. almost moist. You know. Um, I think it's just amazing to have the bread from Pompeii. I mean, it's beyond it's amazing. Those loaves, yes, those it, loaves just are just amazing. Uh, incredible. It's Unbelievable. Thanks. Well, probably yeah. the first video when he uh, put the, I guess, the carrying thing in. Yes. So how do they, does that, the is string. that carried in there with the string? So the string is actually baked into the bread, and that it's, allows the people who are buying it, because they didn't have bags and stuff, to carry it home. That's unique. Never heard of baking string. Well, yes, you know, when you tie up meat with string, right? And you okay, it, right. So you Same can put, thing. you want to make sure that the string is um, cotton and not made of, um, you know, a plastic, because otherwise it would melt. <laughs> so you need to have special, <laughs> special string for it. Yeah. You know, I always find that the poorer the country, the better the bread. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I always wondered how that, how that came about, you know, <clears throat> When you go to Germany, you know, all those, yeah, you know, dark breads and, and, and they're all, you know, very, um, they don't taste as good as a, as a good uh, Italian or, or, or Spanish or, 
or you know Moroccan bread. Uh, it it just doesn't taste as good. It's it's more it's it's more. I don't know. It's not refined, but it's mm -hmm. um, the taste. Is, I, why why does that happen? So on um, the darker breads uh, would still have you know the whole grain has more flavor. What what white bread is is they take. Uh, all of the outside of the coating of the germ and they get rid of that, that fiber and everything. So all you're left with is carbohydrate. You know, think about a um, potato, right? White potato doesn't have a lot of flavor. So it's sort of the same idea. You're down to just the starch. So that's why white bread doesn't have a lot of flavor. When you have dark breads, you have the germ in there, the oils in there and you get the flavor. And then my other comment to that too, which I agree with you. My father was in advertising and his client was Mercedes Benz and he had to go on a business trip to Stuttgart and meet with the very, oh, yeah. very top level executives at, at, um, at Daimler yeah. Benz. And he was all excited to go because my grandma, his mother-in-law was German and my grandmother made sauerbrot and roulade and red cabbage. And, and my father, and he grew up in American New England food, which was very plain. His mother made meat and potatoes, not a lot of flavor. Um, and so he was going to Germany and he was so excited he was going to have German food. And he came back and he says, oh no, they took me to the, the uh, very high restaurants. Well, high restaurants don't serve sauerbraten. Sauerbraten was a meat that was eaten by right. people who peasants. were peasants because they had to marinate it for five days to make it tender. And of course the marinating is what you know gives it the flavor. So um, so he was very disappointed. So yes, I think sometimes, you know, the, the poor people eat the food tastes better. Yeah. Because they have to be maybe more creative to make it taste better. Um, they don't have much, so I don't know. Um, they have good yeah, German beer. Right, go they have good German beer. <laughs> you know, it's a good question. They had wine back in um, in uh, the 70 ADs, but um, I would, I don't know how the wine, when did beer, come into the picture, Sue. I'm not sure. Did your dad have good beer when he went? Oh, he didn't drink. <laughs> my oh. father doesn't drink. So no beer. No, no. My grandfather, who was German, 100% German, he had a Budweiser uh, er, er, twice a day, one at lunch in a frozen mug and one at, one at dinner. And it was What's Bud. Uh, Gabby's homework, Holly? What did Gabby's you... homework is to find out when was beer. Yeah, when was beer? Well, people, we talked about, um, you know, with the Guinness lecture, we talked about the fact that people felt that drinking um, drinks with alcohol, it was safer for them to drink that than water because water was pretty much contaminated to the lack, to, due to the lack of sewers. So, um, and we know that, that Arthur Guinness was made, his father, Richard Guinness was making beer in the 1500s for sure. So um, people fermented whatever they had um, at the time. So, you know, if you were uh, in um, Russia, you know, you had vodka, well, that's because that's the crop that they have. And in America, we make bourbon because we had corn and bourbon has to be 70%, uh, mash has to be corn. So uh, people will ferment whatever they can find. And uh, so fermentation has been around forever as has cheese making has been forever. Um, so do you know where the word upper crust comes from? No. Well, it comes from uh, when they bake bread uh, the upper crust of the bread was given to the wealthy and then mm. the lower part was given oh, to the poor people. And oh, so wow. that's, that's where the upper crust comes from. Wow. Mm. Thanks for sharing that. That's neat. That's neat. Do any of you bake your own bread? It's fascinating to listen <laughs> to the history of, mm. of food. Um, I, I would have never known anything of that um, until you presented it to us. So, you know, thank you. Thank you oh, so you're much. Welcome. Yeah, so the next one's baklava and I-, I Are we I, gonna have I, samples for that? Yeah, that one, yeah, maybe I'll make it. <laughs> well, what I did is um, I had a, uh, my niece was getting mar married on Block Island and there's not a lot of restaurants and we're trying to keep things kind of simple. So, um, I offered to my husband and I to host the rehearsal dinner at our summer house that we have there. And, and I cater on the side. I don't really do it for money, but I, I've been cooking my whole life. So I said I would cater it. So we ended up with a Mediterranean themed meal. And you know, we were kind of, we have an ocean view and it was very nice. And so for dessert, I had people, I didn't want, I wanted finger food for dessert. So we had watermelon, 
And I thought, well, then I'm just gonna have some nice cookies, but in keeping with the Mediterranean theme, I made some cookies, I love to make cookies, um, that have date, have a date kind of paste in the middle and then you roll it up and then you cut it so it looks like a snail. And because uh, dates are, were obviously native to um, the Mediterranean forever. And then I made, I decided, well, baklava would be the traditional Mediterranean dessert, but I, it's sticky and you don't want to eat that with your hands and stand up and eat it, kind of awkward. So I made, I decided to, I invented my own baklava cookie. And so what I did is I took the phyllo and I made the little, if you've ever been to a party and had the spinach triangles, you know, I rolled them up. So I just took the baklava fill, filling, rolled them in the triangles and then, um, bake them right before I was to serve them because they're really good when they're crispy. And then put some confectioner sugar on top and put them out and people love them. So um, yeah, it's possible I could bake those for you. <laughs> and, uh, you can try my bottom of cookies. What a good idea. What a good idea. They have phyllo dough in the supermarket. Yes, um, I, I do. I do use the phyllo dough in the supermarket. This time I bought um, Whole Foods had an organic one. It was $5 for the um, it was a little more, more expensive, but I thought the phyllo was better. Um, really? Was it? Yeah, I do. I do did think it was a better product. Also, um, what was I going to say about the phyllo? Um, people think phyllo is hard to work with. It's not, it's not that bad. You got to work a little fast, but, and you have to defrost it, you know, make sure like the day, but you make the decision the day before to take it out of the freezer and put it in the fridge and let it come to temperature. But, um, but I can make cookies all day long. I, I am, uh, I love to make cookies and, uh, I just, we had a plumber help us out and I just made this plumbing company, the Westport Plumbing, and I decided to, they were so nice and everything. I baked them cookies for Easter and I got a note back and they say, nobody ever bakes us cookies. <laughs> but I think, but, I think you're either a cook or a baker. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think uh, you can be both because it's, um, it's a totally different technique. It uh, is. If, it if, is. You're a, yep. if you're a cook, you just do it. Uh, you know, yep. like the, had an old neighbor who was Italian and he said, I do it with a heart. You know, he yes. doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't no. measure, he doesn't do anything. No. And, uh, it's the, but with cookies and cakes, everything baking has to is, so is a science. It's, it's baking so is a science. science. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I actually make a cake and if you've been, any of you came to my, um, my British tea, I made a cake um, called Dover cake. And it's actually not from Dover, Delaware, it's from Dover, England. And, and the uh, colonists brought it over that recipe with them to America. And so that's another one we could do. Um, it's, it is so good. It's made with, um, uh, cur uh, I wanna say currants. And then and you soak the currants in, in amaretto. Ooh. And then it's made with amaretto and cream. And it's a wonder, and I make them into little bun cakes and they are delicious. Um, and we could do that recipe too, because that one's been around since colonial times. And it's leavened because we didn't have baking powder then. So it's, um, what's the leavening? Vinegar? I think it's vinegar and baking soda. So, uh, which is kind of an old fashioned leavening. We can talk about that as well. So, um, but I, I am a baker. I cook, but mm -hmm. I, I am a baker. So at 16, I baked my sister's wedding cake, decorated oh, it. Oh, wow. And we had three tiers. I had no, I spent the entire winter learning how to make frosting roses and, and did all that. I've, I've been a food person for uh, forever. It's, um, I don't know, I made Thanksgiving it's dinner. Your when I was yeah, it's, when I was 13, I made, I made Thanksgiving dinner all by myself for my whole family. And uh, I didn't tell my mother. She bought all the ingredients and she was working and Wednesday afternoon, I got home from, from school and said, you know, I'll just start prepping Thanksgiving dinner. And I, by the time she got home, I had it all done. So it was ready to go in the oven. And then I thought, well, and I thought, oh, she might be mad at me because I she didn't ask me to do this. And I came home, she's like, no, that's great. <laughs> so anyway. When is um, your next presentation, Holly? My next presentation <laughs> is in about. May. It's uh, May, I think it's May 6th. May 6th, okay. I think it is, baklava. Yeah, but if I, I'll ask Sue if I can make the cookie, the baklava cookies. I can make baklava, but the cookies are kind of nice because you can, they're just easier to transport. So I'm, wor I'm working on something, but I heard baklava. You can do whatever you want yeah. to bring baklava <laughs> in my house. <laughs> now, we were saying we may, I make baklava cookies instead of making it into little squares are much easier to eat. But um, Sue has a, uh, a colleague in Stanford who's Greek, and I guess her baklava is really good. Yeah. Does she make it or her, her family makes it? 
No, she makes it. I think she learned from her mom, but yeah, she makes, oh, it's, I get it once a year. It's fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Very sweet. Makes your teeth tingle. It's so sweet. It yeah. so oh, it is sweet. It yeah. is sweet. Baklava and cannolis, my favorite. Uh, a good cannoli. Good cannoli. Hard to find. Yes. I went to yes. a bakery in uh, Bridgeport on um, Easter Sunday and stood in line for an hour for my cannoli this year. Are you kidding? Where, where, where did is you go? Bakery? On Main Street, um, Da Petre or Da Petre. Oh, oh, I've seen that. Okay. It was very good, but like I said, you had to wait in line for an hour. Are you sure they're Italian, Sue? Excuse me? I assume they're Italian? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What yeah. is that Italian bakery, uh, Italian um, pastry that's made with phyllo dough? It, it starts with SP or something ah, like that. Sfogliatelle. Oh, yeah. Sfogliatelle. What's, yeah. it, what's it called? Sfogliatelle. Yeah. What? I think. I think you're referring to S-F-O-L-I-A-T-E-L-A. -S yeah. I think it's <laughs> Okay. Um, call them, I, I can't them, make it, but I can. No. <laughs> I know what you it, mean. Um, they call Virginia, it lobster tail. You? They call it lobster tails. Sometimes they refer to it as a lobster yeah. tail. My mother called it they, sweet they dough, are, but that is the are root, just, right? They're the perfect uh, between a cannoli and a baklava. Oh, you know, I love those. Yeah. Cheesecake is also good. Yeah, cheesecake. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, not so American. I like the I'm Italian. I'm hungry. <laughs> I know. <laughs> We need to have a party. So anyway, well, thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you for job. Thank you. Good job. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you.